The following content is provided under a Creative Commons license. Your support will help MIT OpenCourseWare continue to offer high-quality educational resources for free. To make a donation or view additional materials from hundreds of MIT courses, visit MIT OpenCourseWare at ocw.mit.edu. I'm Bob Field. I have been called one of the grand old men of spectroscopy. Uh, the reason for that is that I'm old. Uh, but I also have unconventional views of, of what spectroscopy is and what's interesting in spectroscopy. Um, before we get started, I want to tell you what the uh, the formal requirements for the course will be. There will be some occasional homeworks. Not one a week, or maybe not even two a week, but when I come up with a good problem, I'll assign it. There's going to be frequent five-minute quizzes at the end of the hour, where the idea is that you'll unwrap a concept, and you'll just use it to do something really trivial with it while it's, while it's still hot. And I find that that's a good way of actually realizing whether you learn something or not. And uh, uh, it's useful for me also to see whether I was successful. Um, I think there will be, depending on how many people are left in the class by the end, there will be a project at the end where what well, I will try to do is to get you to use some of the concepts in the course to write a not trivial quasi-paper, which might even be publishable. Um, and uh, um, this would be a collaboration among two or three people, because maybe one is good at writing code, and one is good at deriving the, the equations, and one is good at writing, or something like that. But we'll see. Um, the final thing will be a brief oral exam, one-on-one, -on -one, where I'll ask you a few questions. And look, I have to have some formal requirements. This is a, a course with a grade. And so these are all things that make it possible for me to take this seriously. But I'm not going to try to humiliate anybody in an oral exam. I mean, this would be, you come to my office and talk to me for a few minutes, maybe 15, and uh, there will be also some reading. Okay. So, I have a very unconventional view of spectroscopy, and I hope that this is, well, first of all, this course is a version of a course I gave for the first 25 years I was at MIT. And it does have in it my unique view of spectroscopy. This book by Peter Burnett, who was one of my students, is a very conventional uh, view of spectroscopy. And if you feel indigestion from my crazy stuff, you can look at this, and it'll bring it all down to earth. Uh, there are two other books that have been extremely important to me in my professional development. One of them is Continent of Shortly, which is just a beautiful book about atomic spectra. And everything that I know about electronic structure of molecules really comes from this book. And it's a wonderful book. When I was a postdoc, uh, I made the arrogant statement that this little book by John Haugen, The Calculation of Rotational Energy Levels and Rotational Line Intensity uh, in Diatomic Molecules, contained everything that you needed to know in all three of Hertzberg's books. That's ridiculous. But it's not completely ridiculous. So here is some 49 pages, which really is the minimal introduction to my kind of spectroscopy. This book is now available online, so you don't even have to steal it from me. You can just go to the National Institute of NIST website and find it. Uh, this is my book. This is the book on small molecule spectroscopy. 
And so anything I say is probably going to hear. And this is a telephone directory. <laughs> and many people feel that spectroscopy is a bunch, is just collecting a bunch of numbers that resemble a telephone directory. And small molecule spectroscopists are not held in very high esteem because people think what, the, what we do is write telephone directories. And we don't. And what I'm going to try to do in this course is to convince you that uh, there's some beautiful patterns and there's, there's some codes that we can break. And we'll learn a great deal that's far more interesting than telephone directories. OK, so the main things that I'm going to teach you, uh, there's a language of spectroscopy. There's an elaborate notation. And many people get stopped either by the telephone directory aspect or by this, uh, this, what appears to be impenetrable notation. It's very concise. It's very elegant. And it, ex it has a, a kind of ability to describe things at different levels of how much do we know. So you know, normally, you can describe something if you understand it perfectly. But spectroscopy has a way of describing things at the beginning of understanding all the way up to a complete picture. And so the language is not just a boring little thing, and I, and I will refer to it often. There are also toy models. In fact, everything in spectroscopy starts with toy models. In other words, we know about rigid rotors, we know about harmonic oscillators, we know about Rydberg, uh, the hydrogen atom, we know about the hydrogen 2 plus molecular ion. We have a lot of simple models that we use to describe energy levels. And spectroscopy really involves tying all those models together in some imaginable, imaginative way. And I also want to stress that this is not about the exact Hamiltonian that we build an effective Hamiltonian that represents the spectrum and the dynamics in the spectrum, which is made out of these toy models. And many of you who are interested in theory are interested in getting, uh, doing exact calculations. But for spectroscopy, the exact calculations are often the direct path to the telephone direct. Because they're numbers without mechanism, without description. I mean, they're description without causality. Often good theorists do uh, distill from the exact Hamiltonian mechanism. But the emphasis is usually on exact. And here, we're going to be talking about toy models that are built from, uh, that are connected together, and we then use them to uh, explain the spectrum. And of course, Perturbation theory is going to be very important in uh, this, these toy models. Now, um, in perturbation theory, we're going to have a lot of things we call matrix elements. Those of you who know about the matrix picture of quantum mechanics know what that means. Can I use the language of matrix elements for everybody? Is everybody happy with that? OK. Uh, now, there are two ways in which matrix elements are evaluated. One is that we have scaling, that we have rules, selection rules for which ones are 0. And we often have scaling rules for how one matrix element is related to another. And so if we know one fact, we can generate a huge number of related facts through those sorts of things. So there's, there's the structure of the matrix elements, and then there's the process of evaluating matrix elements. The value of this integral accumulates in a very special region of space. And there is great insight often in figuring out 
Where does a matrix element uh, acquire its value? And so the, the concept of stationary phase is going to play a key role in all of this. Okay, so we have language, toy models, we have intensities. And when we start talking about intensities, there are several different issues. Now, I do hope you'll interrupt me and ask me this, you know, to amplify on things. But right now, I'm just making long lists. But I'm going to ask you guys a question, too. Uh, in fact, it's in this little module right here. Okay, so when we talk about intensities, we have the concept of bright states and dark states. This is a very important concept in spectroscopy. And you've probably heard it, uh, heard the term used, but you wonder what it is. There are also things called propensity rules. And there are things like frank condon factors. And there's two kinds of frank condon factors. There's evaluate an overlap integral and square it. And there is the semi-classical, or, or the classical frank condon factor, which uh, is directly related to this number, but most people don't think of, about frank condon factors as classical mechanical quantities. Here we have the word semi-classical expressions. What does semi-classical mean? Does anyone want to tell me what semi-classical means? I mean, you that's not what I mean by it. Uh, but that, I mean, that's a very good answer. Uh, does anybody else want to try? Uh, let's see, you take a classical formulation and then you add certain parts to it which resemble. I think you've got almost all of it. I would have started from quantum mechanics. We were saying, in quantum mechanics, we can have, uh, we can specify coordinates, but then you can't specify momentum. And in the semi-classical approach, one, one says, well, we use, say, coordinates, and we can then spe use classical mechanics to specify what the classical momentum would be at any point. Or, and, and these ideas of bringing in classical mechanics so and and and, and using this to uh, explain quantum mechanics because uh, wave function is going to have nodes the spacing the spatial spacings between nodes are related to the, uh, the uh, momentum but if we're talking about coordinates, we're, we're not allowed to talk about momentum. But we can. And the, the beauty of semi-classical approach is that we can, we can talk about whatever we want by going to classical mechanics and then use that for insights or to make important approximations of key quantities. So is one example of that in a vibration of a molecule that the molecule spends more time near its turning points? So things are more likely to happen there. Is that an example? Well, that's part of it. But is that I mean, an example of a semi-classical? But one of the, the, I would say the most important thing is where is the first node? How far do you have to go from the turning point into the first node? Mm -hmm. And uh, how far are the nodes apart? Mm -hmm. And because that's where you discover where integrals accumulate. You get stationary phase, stationary phase is a mixture of quantum mechanics and classical mechanics. So, okay, so we're going to be talking about models for how things work. We're going to talk about intensities uh, and I'm going to teach you how to assign spectrum. Now this is something which those of you who are not in my research group are going to want why is that? I've never heard about that. Yeah. No textbook ever talks about how you assign spectra. Spectra are not born with assignments on them. 
there is some trick, something that enables you to say, this transition has these quantum numbers. And we do it, well, quantum numbers are how many nodes does the wave function have? And where are, how, how are the nodal surfaces organized? But there is no way experimentally to observe nodes or to observe the wave function. So how do we make assignments based on things we can't observe directly? And it's based on the existence of patterns and the ability to somehow disentangle various patterns. And so this is not a trivial and boring thing. This is the essence of what we do. And all insight comes from uh, the assignments. And often you have to design an experiment which makes the assignments clear. So I'm going to talk about assigning spectra. And uh, OK. Now, in 574, there is a rigorous treatment of the interaction of light with matter. I'm not going to talk about that. I'm going to be talking about radiation as photons, like bullets. And so I'm not going to be talking about uh, uh, experiments or how you rigorously design an experiment. I'm going to be talking mostly about the energy levels, the Hamiltonian, and how you interact with that, but not so much how you do clever things with the system. So photons as bullets, not the correct treatment. Um, and the last issue is how is dynamics encoded in frequency domain. This is an interesting issue because in the frequency domain, one is looking at eigenstates. And eigenstates don't move. So what do we mean by dynamics? But I will show you, or insist, that dynamics, anytime you have a data set with a lot of structure, you can use that to break a code and to say, oh yeah, there, the dynamics is encoded in this complicated data set, whether it's a time domain or a frequency domain data set. And I will show you how to break those codes. OK. So that's the general outline. And now I'm going to talk about some of the models that you're going to use. Rotation. Well, everybody knows what rotation is. That's a rigid rotor. And the rigid rotor has uh, uh, an energy level formula, some constant times an integer times an integer plus one. That's a very familiar thing. Now we can generalize. We can do things that are more complicated than rigid rotor. We can do a symmetric top or an asymmetric top. But one of the simplest things in spectroscopy is the rotational degree of freedom. I can, I can deal with all rotation for all conceivable molecules in about two lectures. But rotation is an important part because that's where we get a lot of the patterns. And in fact, the rotation often provides you some hidden information about the symmetries of things. OK, then we have vibration. And we are very happy with harmonic oscillators. Everything at small displacements from equilibrium is a harmonic oscillator. And so that's a pattern that we're going to use a lot, even when it's not true, even when the oscillators are neither harmonic nor uncoupled. So, but we're going to describe vibration in terms of harmonic oscillators, then we're going to couple them, uh, and we'll deal with both, we'll, we'll deal with anharmonicity of two types. One is within one oscillator and between oscillators. And the tool for dealing with that is perturbation theory. Now, the hardest problem of all is the electronic one. But again, we have some 
simple models to describe the electronic property. We have hydrogen, we have helium, we have H2+, plus, and uh, we have the particle in a box. All th this one, this one, and this one are things that you've all thought about. And so hydrogen atom gives us Rydberg states, Rydberg series. Uh, and that actually turns out to be a model for electrons scattering off of something. Because there are an infinite number of more or less identical Rydberg states. But, so hydrogen atom is extremely important in our understanding of electronic structure. But it's really much less important than the helium atom and H2+. Plus. But the particle in a box is also really important because it tells us size effects. And so uh, if you know how the energy levels scale with uh, the length of the box and the mass, you know an awful lot about, uh, well, electrons always have the same mass unless you're in solids. But the, uh, we're talking about gas phase systems, so the electron has the same mass. But the size, uh, the space available to it is an, a, a crucial interpretive thing. Okay, so H2 plus gives us LCA, a linear combination of atomic orbitals to make molecular orbitals. And this is an extremely valuable uh, zero order picture for valence states of molecules. This is for Rydberg states of molecules. And helium provides us with exchange. So helium tells us the beginning of how do electrons talk to each other as well as to the nuclear. And so these four paradigms provide us with everything we need to deal with electronic structure. Okay, now I have another question. How big is an orbital? How, how do we know how, how, what's the size of an orbital? I'm sorry? Infinite. Well, yeah, infinite, but let's say, okay, the full width and half maximum. Okay, so, I mean, that's, that's a very good answer, but it's not the one I want. And I, I, I'm up here, and I got control here. So we have some kind of a distribution of charge, and it does go to infinity, although that's really not important. But where is half of it? So do we have some crude, simple way of estimating the size of an orbital? Uh, I mean, the next question would be, well, how would we measure it? How do you measure a wave function? You don't measure a wave function. So uh, having a simple way of this, deciding on how big something is is really valuable because you can't measure it. You can measure things that are related to it, but how do you, so how do we make a decision about uh, how big an orbital is? Anybody want to tell me? I mean, we can use one of these paradigms to describe how big an orbital is. This one would be really stupid because its energy levels go to, I mean, it, it's bound all the way up. And we know that an orbital is, is bound uh, up to a certain, I mean, the, there's a certain energy that you can add and the electron is then free. So this is the wrong thing. This is needlessly complicated. This doesn't have, uh, uh, this is not round, and so maybe we should use this. Energy of you got it. Okay, so, but it's just, it's, it's really putting together things that uh, you normally wouldn't put together, but you get, from the energy below ionization, you get the size. And how do you get the size? You use these two formulas. So this is the distance below ionization. And that's equal to the Rydberg constant over n squared. Okay, but you don't know what it is. Uh, um, and, uh, uh, 
we have from from the uh, the hydrogen atom, we have the formula, the, the four radius over two times the charge on the uh, n squared minus L plus one. Or you could use a formula from the Bohr atom. I mean, this is just needlessly complicated. Okay, and you solve this now for uh, n. Uh, I'm sorry, you solve this one for n. And so you have n is equal to the Rydberg over i p minus the n l root. And we stick. So this is a measure. This is something you measure. You know what the ionization energy is. You know the energy below ionization. This is a constant. So this is a way of getting n, which we then put into this formula. We get the size. And so you have it absolutely right. If you know what the ionization energy is, then you can say, OK, from how far you are below, it determines the size. If you're far below, it's small. If, it's, if you're up high, it's big. And this is a really useful thing for finding your way around in uh, uh, complicated systems. You always want to find a way to estimate a quantity or to estimate how something should scale. And, if, and one of the things you're always doing is trying to find out, is this too crude? Uh, and usually, uh, the most naive concepts work really well. But how is this radius? An orbital related to any molecular property. Because this well, is of a hydrogen atom. If you stick two hydrogen atoms together, this well, but you still have how far is the energy? How bound is that electron? Mm -hmm. You're pulling off an electron, mm -hmm. and you're asking, well, what is the lowest ionization energy? Well, actually, you can be more specific. You uh, suppose you know the uh, ionization energy to the ground state of the ion. And maybe there's some electronically excited state of the ion. Then you could ask, OK, how big are different orbitals? Not just the highest occupied molecular orbital, mm -hmm. but some other one. Mm -hmm. And all of these work, at least qualitatively. So it doesn't matter that it's not round. It really matters how far is it below. And uh, especially if you're up at relatively high energy, the, ele the orbitals are pretty round. OK, I actually agree with that. But I'm saying, let's say you have one hydrogen atom. Yes. And now we've calculated how big one orbital is. Yeah. Now I want to make H2. Yes. Does this calculation tell me anything about the H2 molecule? Yeah. Yeah. So if I add the two of them, if, if I add that together, does that really tell me? Well, it, 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 it tells you we're going to make a spherical approximation, but uh, uh, H2 is pretty pretty spherical. And so, uh, you know, maybe, maybe you make lithium fluoride. And but, but does that tell me anything about the equilibrium bond distance? No, it tells you how far the electron is away from the, uh, the center of mass. Or center of charge, to be more specific. But for most molecules, the center of charge and the center of mass are almost coincident. So it's really, really important to make disgustingly gross approximations. Because they tell you how to find your way around in these sorts of problems. OK, now I'm going to, again, go through and talk about uh, the various classes of problems and how do we approach them. And does someone want to tell me how far I am from the end of the, the hour? About halfway. Uh, halfway, OK, I can do this properly. Then. OK, so one of the real problems is uh, uh, many electron systems for electronic structure. And uh, when, we, when most of us decided to be chemists, it was when we saw in freshman chemistry the periodic table. And discovered that very simple concepts enabled us to make predictions about the properties of all of the atoms in isolation. And that is very beautiful. So we have 
a periodic table, we have the properties of the isolated atoms. As soon as we start looking in detail about the spectra of atoms or the properties of molecules, we lose almost all of this. But for atoms, for many electron atoms, we have a way of dealing with this. We have orbitals, configurations, and LSJ electronic states, which are called by spectroscopic terms. Uh, and I try to use the correct language. But, you know, so we have orbitals, configurations, and terms. And the orbitals are the things that ought to exhibit periodicity. But the things we observe are energy levels, and they don't. And so one of the ways in which we recover the periodic table is we calculate uh, electronic properties. This is orbital energies. This is a spin orbit coupling constant. This is a Coulomb integral. Uh, these are one electron properties. These are two electron properties. This is an exchange integral. And so one can represent the energy levels of the LSJ states that belong to a configuration by looking at these quantities, and these quantities exhibit periodicity. So periodicity goes away, but in the effect of Hamiltonian, or in the Hamiltonian that we use to describe the energy levels, we have the quantities, all of which show periodicity. So we haven't lost it. Now we do have trouble when we start going to molecules. But that's just an interesting thing, and I do. I will be talking about some of this archaic stuff. That you know, when you have exact quantum mechanics, why do you bother with thinking about these quantities? But it's because what I want is not a telephone directory. So this periodicity that you say that you still observe um, in the spectra, uh, or at least in the terms of the effect of Hamilton, yeah. Hamiltonian, um, aren't they effectively? You know, uh, don't they have this periodicity because you know they follow the same trends of the periodic table? Like these atoms are getting heavier, or they're increasing in their end. Well, but their shell structure. Where does this? End? You know, just getting heavier isn't enough. You're filling shells. You have systematics of shielding, so that the you know you have a charge on the 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 ion core, and certain orbitals shield more than others, and so you get you get monotonic behaviors but with big uh, big glitches and uh, all of that so that's really the periodicity you know what's the difference between a, uh, a gas and, and a metal or something you know uh, so it's it's all of these things and uh, so that's one example now uh, I now I really uh, I, I'm a diatomic molecule person. Now, we do polyatomic molecules in my group, but most of the, the, the things that in my research group I've gotten credit for uh, as being surprising and wonderful have to do with the vibrations of polyatomic molecules. But my first love is diatomic molecules, and I really am one of the great authorities in the world on diatomic molecules. So uh, I have to force myself not to say too much about diatomic. Um, so, for diatomics, we have, we describe them in terms of a rigid rotor and a harmonic oscillator. And then we say, oh, well, it's not quite rigid and it's not quite uh, harmonic. And so we, we write an energy level expression. V is vibration, J is rotation. Uh, and we write it as a uh, sum of uh, what are called Dunham constants, which multiply So we have a polynomial in the vibrational quantum number and in the rotational quantum numbers. This is just self-defense. This isn't anything significant. We just say, okay, we have energy levels and we're going to have to represent them by some kind of a power series. 
And so we might as well be reasonably intelligent about what the power series is of, but these are just numbers that are used to represent the energy level. And there is another set of numbers where, you know, for a diatomic molecule, the kinetic energy is pretty simple, but the potential energy is where every molecule is different from every other molecule. And we have an expression uh, in terms of polynomials in displacement from equilibrium. This is also done. It's saying, well, we can represent anything in, a, in terms of a power series. Uh, and so we have two different representations, one of the energy level structure and one of the essential thing that makes one molecule different from another, the potential energy curve. And what we really like is some kind of way of relating these things to these things. And Mr. Dunham uh, worked that out by doing semi-classical quantum mechanics. Uh, and it's really old and it's really archaic. Uh, and there's another way of doing this, is, and that's using perturbation theory. And I'll do a lot of that. So if you have a spectrum which you've assigned and determined the bunch of these Dunham constants, then you can invert that to a potential. If you have a potential, and you say, well, I'm going to truncate this. I'm going to represent it as a quadratic cubic plus quartic term. Forget quintic and higher. Well, then I can take these and calculate all of these. Just using perturbation theory. That's something I'd love to do. And you'll so you'll do it. Um, but for diatomics, there's also a thing called rydberg klein reese It's a way of taking the energy levels, these things, or more specifically, the vibrational energy levels, and the rotational constants, two expressions, again, it's power series. These two things, you get the potential energy curve numerically uh, by another consequence of semi-classical quantum the WKB kinetic. So, for diatomic molecules, because you have both G of B and B of B, and because they're one-dimensional potentials, this works. For polyatomic molecules, forget it. And so, the perturbation theory is the only thing that you can use. So, there's a lot of testing of, you know, how good is perturbation theory, how good is RKR, by going back and forth between these two. But the only tool you have for dealing with vibrations of polyatomic molecules is perturbation theory. And sometimes you use RKR as a way of checking or extending. But you, since you don't have, it's not one dimensional, there's no way of getting the, the full inversion. And so this gives you actually distances between turning points. And this gives you a way of finding what the actual turning points are, but that's beside the point of getting into people. Okay, so we have vibrations. Now, diatomic molecules have the wonderful habit of not always being in singlet sigma plus states. Now, you know, when you see a symbol like this, uh, that's called not 3 pi, but triplet pi, g or garata. Uh, but you, this is how you describe a state. You, multiply, you mention its multiplicity, 2s plus 1. You men mention its projection of orbital angular momentum on the symmetry axis. And perhaps some other group theoretical arcana like the, project, the reflection symmetry in a plane that contains the inter-nuclear axis or inversion at the center of mass. So there are extra symbols on these things. But the, the, the formulas that you all expect to be uh, obeyed by diatomic molecules reflect that there is no spin 
or orbital angular momentum, and that you just have a simple state that's closed shell, is behaving without any complexity. But a triplet pi state is like six of these. But we don't call them six states, we call it one state, because there are relationships among the components of a triplet pi. And they're very easy to impose, and, the, and they, they also provide important details on uh, what kind of a state is this. What, I mean, from the pattern of states, you can determine whether it's pi, whether it's g, whether there is a nearby sigma state, there's all sorts of details in the deviations from simple single sigma plus like structure that tell you what's really interesting. And so uh, when we have states with non-zero spin and with non-zero projection of the orbital angular momentum, then we get into things called Bunn's cases. Now, Wundt's case is, uh, is second only to hyperfine structure as a, uh, uh, a sleeping pill. When people hear Wundt's cases or electric quadrupole coupling constant, they immediately know they should go to sleep. But it turns out that both of those things are good for you, better than cod liver oil. Wundt's cases are just a way of taking from the spectrum a simple pattern. But there are several different patterns, depending on the relative size of the knot roundness of the electronic structure, the spin orbit coupling constant, and the rotation. We've got three things, and they can be arranged in any of uh, six ways. And out of that comes five Kuhn's coupling cases, because one of them is impossible to achieve. Uh, and so, but what you get in the limits of one thing being large compared to another is a regular pattern that you can recognize and exploit to make sense of the spectrum. So these coupling cases are really useful, but often a molecule isn't at one of those limits. And so you have to build a model that allows it not to be at that limit and still assign the spectrum. So, uh, What was the, the, the one again? So it was the non roundness of the orbital, the spin orbit coupling, and the. And the rotational constant. So in the rotational Hamiltonian, uh, we have a rotational constant times uh, the rotation of the bare ion, uh, the bare uh, 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 core. But so that R is really J minus L minus S. And so we multiply this out and do all sorts of things. We get things like J dot L and J dot S. This is called L uncoupling. And this results in mixing between states of different lambda. This is spin uncoupling. And this makes the spin uncoupled from the body frame. And uh, so this is, so, OK, this is wonderful. So we have a term, B, J, plus, minus, S, minus, plus. That's the spin on coupling term. And we have spin orbit, which is uh, A lambda LZ, SC. So this gets big with J. And so it will eventually beat this. But at low J, this wins. And so you start out in Hood's case A, and as you go up, in rotation, you go towards with case B. And perturbation theory helps you to do this. Now, you know, I'm not expecting you to understand this now, but it was a nice question, though. You know, and there's always, in the energy level structure of almost every spectroscopic problem, there are two terms at war. One term is trying to destroy the limiting case you're in, and the other term is trying to preserve it. And it's really important to know, well, what, uh, for this particular kind of state, which one am I going to, which is going to be the winner, or which is going to be the winning term that determines the pattern I'm going to see in the spectrum, because that determines how you begin to look at the spectrum. So there's always these 
oppositions between a pattern preserving and a pattern destroying term. And that's a useful thing to know. It's true for vibrations as well as electronic structure. Why is one of the loose cases impossible? Um, let's see, which one would it be? Uh, I don't know. I don't remember. But the, the knot roundness is usually pretty robust. And the, the spin orbit, uh, it, uh, I can't remember which one. It, uh, the rotation is usually pretty puny, and so it's rare that rotation can overcome the knot roundness, except for Rydberg states. And in Rydberg states, spin orbit is always zero. And so that's probably why you can. So, um, so there are other topics that I'm going to talk about in diatomic molecules because that's a good way of illustrating where we're going to go for polyatomics. So. Uh, When you have a diatomic molecule, we have a body frame and a lab frame. So we work in the laboratory. We have radiation sources that we manipulate in the laboratory or we detect radiation in the laboratory. But if the molecule is going to absorb or emit radiation, there is a handle that that radiation grabs in the body frame. And so we're constantly going between these two coordinate systems. And uh, so this actually determines rotational line strengths. And it's an example of a kind of angular momentum transformation that you have to do. And we're going to be doing lots of angular momentum transformations. And uh, okay, so so now electronic structure of diatomic molecules. Well, if you don't know anything, you'll probably use LCAO MO, which is good for uh, diatomic molecules, which are in the uh, the first row of the periodic table are molecules that are pretty homonuclear. Uh, and you can make a lot of progress with this. One of the beautiful things about LCAO MO is it tells you what are the states that are going to be relevant and how bound are things going to be because you have bonding orbitals and antibonding orbitals. And so you can learn a great deal about how the electronic structure is going to be written into the spectrum. But there are other unconventional electronic structure models, which are, are best illustrated for diatomic molecules. And so there's atom, atom in molecule. That's ligand field theory. That's what our inorganic friends do all the time. But they don't generally have such a simple uh, uh, ligand field. You have an atom with many electrons, and you have a point charge remote from it, and it splits the, uh, the orbitals and the states in a predictable and qualitatively useful way. And, uh, uh, but most of the time, we don't do that. But if you had a molecule like calcium fluoride, it would be nominally calcium plus F minus, there's one electron on calcium. And this F minus is closed shell, and you can you can explain the electronic structure in an atom and molecule sense. Or suppose you had uh, a uh, a rare earth like crazy dimmium oxide. Now again, you have now many electrons in closed shells on here being perturbed by this point charge. And again, you make a lot of money by representing things in terms of atom or atomic ion and molecule. The other limit is what's called multi-channel quantum defect theory. And this is a representation of the electronic structure, not in terms of a Hamiltonian, but in terms of scattering an electron off of something and looking at how is that electron 
affected by this object is the standard thing that physicists do. You do scattering and you somehow learn something about the structure of the object that you're scattering on. And what this is expressed in terms of is how is the scattered wave shifted relative to what it would have been if it was hydrogen, if it was scattered off of the hydrogen. You get a phase shift that's called a quantum defect, and this quantum defect can be off diagonal in orbital angular momentum because if you have a not round object and you scatter an electron off of it, you're going to transfer uh, angular momentum uh, between the object and the electron. And so this quantum defect or phase shift is a complicated matrix, but it expresses infinities of states and, uh, in a, in a uh, simple way. So we have these different ways of looking at the electronic structure of diatomics and polyatomics by extension. And ma the main justification for looking at diatomics is because it enables us to approach reality with some tools. Uh, but, I mean, I, I sort of never got out of second grade. So, you know, diatomic molecules, that's more than atoms, but that's what I really love. And, uh, uh, okay, so now, we're polyatomics. So, for polyatomics, the rotation is got something new that we didn't see for atoms, for diatomics. Well, we can have symmetric and asymmetric tops. So instead of just having J as a quantum number, we have two additional quantum numbers, KA and KC. And that, you know, when I first saw that, I said, that's, that's just disgusting. Why do we need so many quantum numbers? It's just not fair. But it, it's not much. It's really quite simple. Uh, and we, for vibration, we have 3n minus 6 normal modes, where n is the number of atoms. And so we have, we have many harmonic oscillators, and to a very good approximation, they don't couple to each other. They're just coexisting in the same uh, uh, outfit. But you could introduce anharmonicity both on the diagonal and between the normal modes. And perturbation theory enables us to understand all that. We've already armed ourselves to deal with this from looking at the relationship between the energy levels and the, and the uh, terms and the potential from diatomic molecules. So the only thing that's new here is that we have couplings between modes, not just within modes, but that's not a big deal. So, but one of the things that happens because for vibrations, there are so many different frequencies. You often have approximate resonances. Suppose you have a uh, symmetric stretch, which is approximately equal to twice a bending frequency. That's, that's called a fairy resonance. Or suppose you have a symmetric stretch, which is approximately equal to an asymmetric stretch anti-symmetric stretch. I insist on anti-symmetric, but everybody says asymmetric. So anyway, if this occurs, then there's a two-to-two -two resonance, and not one by one, one to one, and that's called, called darling Dennis. You get resonance. And when you have resonance, you can't use ordinary non-degenerate perturbation theory. You have to use uh, degenerate or quasi-degenerate perturbation theory and you get things called polyads. These are groups of states that are very strongly coupled. It's a low dimensional state space. As you go up in energy, the dimension gets bigger, uh, the dynamics gets more complicated, but it's all predictable from the lowest realization of such an anharmonic coupling. And so it provides you with a way of looking at what starts to be real dynamics because energy is going from one mode to another. And not only do you, can you describe how fast it's going, but you can describe why it's going. And if there are competing paths, you can understand which is going to win and how different paths might interfere quantum mechanically. It's all very beautiful. And it all comes together from what we already knew about 
accidental degeneracies for diatomic molecules and diagonalizing a, 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 a larger matrix than we would normally do. And in the limit of really complicated stuff, we get intramolecular vibrational redistribution, where the density of states and the couplings between modes are so great that uh, the energy moves uh, around in the molecule in a very complicated way. And uh, uh, it, it may be regular by moving only within a polyad, or the polyads might start interacting with each other, and you might get ergodic behavior. Yeah. Um, could you say a little more about, I guess, polyads and just kind of describe like what they are and maybe what they're limited? Like, is there a certain number of states when you would say, okay, this is a polyad description versus say IVR? Like, is there a distinction? Between okay, well, really, IVR is poly IVR is an, is something that is almost completely described by polyads. But suppose we have a two to one resonance where we have one mode which has twice the frequency of another. So the lowest state would be 0, 0. Then the next state would be 0, 1. The next state would be 1, 0 and 0, 2. These two are the first. And as we go up, there are more and more states in resonance. And as long as the, uh, the simple anharmonic coupling picture scales, we have membership in the polyad which scales, and we have the coupling matrix elements within the polyads which scale. And everything ought to work. But eventually, the density of states gets to be so large that we have you know, a block of uh, states uh, from one polyad and another block of states from another polyad, and they start to talk to each other, and the polyads break. And this is one of the things that I'm really interested in. How far can you push this thing? And is there some way you can fix it? I mean, one of the things that you might have noticed is when I talked about R minus RE over RE, we have a power series in this quantity. Well, when R is larger than twice RE, this can't convert. And so when you have go up to high vibrational excitation, the representation we're using breaks. And so uh, there's an intrinsic death in that uh, picture. But there's another parameterization called Simon's power of Finland. And I think that's our uh, something like this, where we, uh, we have uh, uh, the, the critical thing uh, over a denominator which is larger than it. And that's a, so if we use this as the coordinate, or the, um, then the conjugate co uh, momentum is, is more complicated. So the kinetic energy term gets complicated, but the, the radius of convergence of the potential is similar. So, so that, that, there are all sorts of little Things like that. Okay. So now. So just just to get so the polyad then would be the one zero and zero two. That would be one polyad. You're right. Okay. And then there'd be another one. Uh, and let's let's just jump up. So let's say we have two zero. Then we're going to have one two, and we're going to have zero four. So now it's three of them. And the, uh, yeah. There's three of them. And as you go up, there's more and more, but they're all systematically degenerate. And, uh, but this group is split from that, and so, OK. So the last thing I was going to talk about today as a, uh, to whet your appetite is the dichotomy between structure and dynamics and the spectrum. Spectrum is just lines, line spectrum. Energy, you know, just there are transitions between energy levels. That makes life a little bit complicated because 
it's not telling you the level structure, it's telling you some convolution of two level structures. And so you have to do a lot more work. Uh, but you can usually disentangle. So we have a line structure. And the transitions are between eigenstates, and eigenstates don't move. So here we have a spectrum which is a little bit complicated because it's transitions between groups of states. But the spectrum is expressed in terms of things that aren't moving. So what is this dynamics? Um, when we talk about uh, stru structure and dynamics, we talk about balls and springs. We talk about motion. We have mechanism. I mean, if we have two sets of springs, then you, you can see that energy would go from one spring to another. Uh, we have causality. And so how do we relate these things to those things? And again, it's our old friend perturbation theory. We say we have some zero order term and some coupling term. And the patterns, the zero order patterns that uh, lead to trivial dynamics, you know, this kind of thing, just a, a, a harmonic oscillator or a rigid rotor, that's all in this. This is all the neat stuff. All the things that you have to, the, where you get interesting dynamics, where you get a mechanism for energy to flow from one part of the system to another. And the problem is that the Hamiltonian is of infinite dimension. And so it's all very trivial, but how do you find the energy levels of the eigenstates and eigenvalues of an infinite matrix? Well, you have to use some kind of perturbation theory. And so most of the work goes into the zero order picture, which you choose to be the convenient zero order picture, the one that's close to the patterns you expect to see, and then this is the key thing that gives you, you know, makes it worthwhile to do uh, a PhD thesis, to publish papers, to become famous for being a grand old man's uh, But in order to do to use perturbation theory, you have to assign the spectrum. And so someone's going to have to help you to assign the spectrum. And so this will be a course in going from the Hamiltonian to the spectrum. And that's relatively easy. easy. Because if someone gives you the Hamiltonian, you can always make approximations to predict what the spectrum will be. And the other thing is reality. You go from the spectrum to the Hamiltonian. That's really hard. And that's what this course is about. So that's what you're, uh, you're in for if you stick this out. And I, the, all of the lectures for this course are online. Uh, in um, uh, an OCW source called 576, which is until 1976, 1996, the name of the course. And then it was retired. And this is the, the first time a, I've been able to teach this since it was retired, and it will be the last time. So, but there are a lot of problem sets, there are exams, there's answer problems, there's handouts, uh, and there, it's all there.